Welcome to ISGIP Live Journal Club. I am Natalie Benet, your host. I am an academic pathologist in Rhode Island. I practice at Women and Infants Hospital, which is affiliated with the Warren Alpert School of Medicine at Brown University. For today's meeting, we will first have brief remarks and introductions, and then move on to our trainee presentations, which will each last approximately 12 minutes. Since this is a webinar format, you will not be able to unmute or speak. However, you can use the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can type in your questions there. You may also upvote other people's questions with the thumbs up button. The questions will then be prioritized for answering at the end of the session. So we will save questions for the end of the meeting. For those who may be unfamiliar, the International Society of GYN Pathologists was founded in 1976 in order for pathologists and other physicians around the world to share ideas and knowledge regarding the female reproductive system. Recently, the organization initiated a new series of educational events known as ISGIP Live, including webinars, live slide sessions, podcasts, and I have been fortunate to have this journal club be selected as a part of this effort. These events are available to all live. This journal club and the podcast are available to all in archived form, while the recordings of the webinars and slide sessions will be for ISGIP members only. For information about upcoming events and how to become a member, you may go to isgip.ca. This is an example of recent offerings, including the inaugural webinar, which was held on August 6th, featuring Dr. Esther Leva, who discussed problem areas in the diagnosis of uterine smooth muscle tumors. The first podcast on the lower left corner featured Drs. Kay Park and Laura Hedrick Allenson, who discussed how to review a medical article with focus on pathology literature. And upcoming events include the next podcast featuring Drs. Lin Huang and Carlos Hera Peron, where she discusses her recent article about P53 interpretation in squamous lesions of the vulva, which relates well to the topics we're discussing today. And finally, in the lower right-hand corner, the inaugural live slide session featuring Dr. Joe Rabin, where he will discuss uterine mesenchymal tumors with deceptively bland morphology. I would also like to thank those at ISGIP who have supported me in this educational effort, including Dr. Zester Oliva, Navina Singh, Blake Jilks, Laura Hedrick Allenson, Kay Park, Joe Rabin, and Carlos Hera Peron. The objectives of the GYN Pathology Journal Club are to engage trainees in gaining scientific knowledge and the ability to critically evaluate the literature, to offer opportunities for trainees and young members from all parts of the globe to volunteer as presenters, to provide mentorship, and to engage the future leaders of our field from around the globe. The structure of Journal Club is of rotating topics that repeat every 12 months, this month being vulva and vagina. Housekeeping, um, just a quick reminder to upvote questions which you would like to see answered, and a note that the trainees who are presenting are not subject matter experts, but are here to increase their knowledge and learn about critically evaluating the literature. So I will curate questions accordingly. Um, we will make an effort to have a fulsome discussion, but we can continue on Twitter. We'll use the hashtag isgipjc. You can also go to the Journal Club homepage, which is pictured here on the upper right-hand corner, where I will post follow-up information, as well as the isgip.ca website, which is in the lower right-hand corner, and specifically archived Journal Club recordings and discussions are available if you click that link that I've put a red circle around there. Additionally, when you exit the webinar today, you may follow a link which will pop up and will take you to an evaluation. We are very interested in hearing your thoughts and comments. This month's articles are listed um, here and we will be going in this order as we present. This month's presenters are Dr. Nivedita Ghosh, who is a pathologist based in Singapore, Dr. Samira Rashid, who is a current GYN and Breast Pathology Fellow in Cotter and has presented multiple times before, and Dr. Hanan Ribeiro, who is a GYN and Breast Pathology Fellow at my hospital, Women and Infants in Rhode Island. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and we will move on to Dr. Nivedita Ghosh. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thanks, uh, convey my thanks to Dr. Natalie for giving me this opportunity to present in an international journal club. 
today i'm going to present uh, a journal with uh, a journal article which was uh, published in july american journal of surgical pathology the article is hpv independent precursors mimicking high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions of the vulva authored by dr rakis lowan dr aleman dr clavero dr ordi et al from department of pathology institute of global health catlin institute of oncology barcelona ddl diagnostic labs netherlands we all know that there are two etiopathogenic types of vulval squamous cell carcinomas and each subtype arises from a specific variety of intraepithelial lesion the hpv associated vulval squamous cell carcinoma develops from high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions and its pathogenesis is sharply defined on the other hand the pathogenesis of hpv independent vulval squamous cell carcinomas is poorly understood majority of them arises from differentiated vulval intraepithelial lesions which arises in a which are generally associated with a background of chronic inflammatory skin disorders like lichen sclerosus and lichen simplex chronicus there are some newer uh, entities which have been uh, identified like vulval acanthosis with altered differentiation differentiated exophytic vulval intraepithelial lesions and these entities are still controversial and considered to be precursors of verrucous carcinoma over the years it has been found that there is morphological overlap between both types of tumors and hence the use of ancillary studies like p16 and hpv dna analysis to better classify same morphological overlap has been found between the precursors that is like hpv associated lesions can be simulating hpv independent precursors and hpv independent lesions can mimic hcl high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions also called as the hcl like lesions the frequency and morphological spectrum of these hcl like lesions haven't been well characterized so the aim of this study was to explore the frequency histological and immunohistochemical features of the precursors in large series of well characterized hpv independent vulval squamous cell carcinomas focusing mainly on the hcl like lesions study design This was mainly a morphological and clinical pathological study. There were 779 cases of vulval uh, HPV independent vulval squamous cell carcinomas, and they were histologically reviewed. 254 of them had adjacent premalignant lesions. Out of these 254 cases, 46 were HCL-like lesions. They were further subtyped as basaloid, warty, and mixed basaloid warty types. Mean age of these patients was 72 years. 35% had associated differentiated VIN. All of these cases were P16 negative, and 74% had abnormal P53 expression. Materials and methods. All the cases were taken from VVAP study coordinated at Catalan Institute of Oncology, Barcelona, and DDL Diagnostic Labs, Netherlands. 1,709 cases of vulval squamous cell carcinoma were reviewed by two pathologists, Dr. Navid, Dr. Rakit Slova, and Dr. Ordi, independently. 779 cases fulfilled the inclusion criteria. HPV was detected using PCR and P16, and both together formed the gold standard to exclude the HPV association. The, hist the cases were histologically evaluated for presence of precursor intraepithelial lesions. inflammatory lesions or just the normal skin precursor lesions were further subtyped as differentiated vin vulval acanthosis with altered differentiation and hcl like lesions p53 and p16 immunohistochemistry was done in all the cases p16 was considered positive when there was block like staining p53 was evaluated as wild type or abnormal based on the pattern of expression results out of the 779 cases which fulfilled the inclusion criteria 329 had normal skin 196 cases had inflammatory lesions alone and 254 cases had intraepithelial precursors and made, that was around 33% majority of these cases 73% were differentiated vin 9% were vaad and 18% were hcl like lesions that is 46 cases these cases of other subtype as 26 cases basaloid type 13 cases warty type and 7 cases mixed warty basaloid type all the cases were p16 negative 74% showed abnormal p53 expression and 35% were associated with differentiated vin this slide shows three cases of basaloid type hcl like lesions with abnormal p53 expression 
In the first case, we see architectural disarray, replacement by homogeneous small keratinocytes, and absence of maturation. The P53 shows parabasal type of expression, and the third slide shows an area of invasive component. The second post case shows similar morphology with acanthosis and presence of these melanocytes. The P53 shows null pattern of expression, and they were adjacent areas of DVIN. How do we characterize DVIN? Presence of elongated and astomoting rated edges, moderate degree of cy sorry, basal cytological ATP, and presence of abrupt keratinization and hyperisonophilia of the upper epidermis. The third case shows moderate degree of cellular pleomorphism, along with presence of some degree of maturation. P53 shows cytoplasmic type of expression with nuclear expression in the bromal cells as control. And the last slide shows the invasive component in the same case. The next slide shows two cases of basaloid type of axial like lesions with normal P53 expression. In the case one, we, we see the scattered pattern of P53 expression, and they were adjacent areas of lichen sclerosis identified by th thinning of the epidermis and underlying homogenization of the collagen. The case two shows middle, uh, mid epithelial pattern of P53 expression and adjacent areas of differentiated BIN. This is a case of warty type of HCL like lesion with hyper with uh, which shows papillary and exophytic features. There is hyperkeratosis, acanthosis, and some coilocytic like changes, which is evident, and mild cellular pleomorphism. There is parabasal type of P53 expression. The P16 was completely negative. This is these two tables show the 46 cases of HCL like lesions. The first table shows the 34 cases of abnormal P53 expression, and the second table shows the wild pattern of P53 expression. In these 12 cases, the first seven cases, the, if we see the invasive component that shows the abnormal P53 expressions. The author interpreted this because of the P53 mutations which had been acquired as a late event. Apart from the P53 expression, the table also shows the presence of other intraepithelial precursors and the inflammatory skin lesions. The authors found that more than one third or 35% of the cases showed HCL, uh, of these HCL like cases were associated with differentiated VIN and lichen sclerosis. Apart from differentiated VIN, VAAD and DEVIL were other associated intraepithelial lesions which were identified. If we see the invasive carcinomas, majority of them were keratinizing squamous cell carcinomas. Coming to the discussion, the present study was compared to compared mainly to the study done by a few of the same authors and published in 2009 American Journal of Surgical Pathology. The proportion of the HCL like lesions was 6%, which was higher than their previous study. Because of the more awareness of the unusual morphologies, HCL like lesions represented 18% of the precursors, which was much higher than their previous study. Similarly, they detected VAAD and DEVIL, which was previously not found apart from the differentiated VIN, pure warty like and mixed warty and basaloid type had not been previously reported. They found that there was broader spectrum of P53 expression, and hence it is not entirely reliable to identify HCL-like lesions using P53. 74% of these HCL-like lesions showed abnormal P53 pattern, a percentage which was similar to conventional differentiated VIN done by a study uh, done by the study which was published in 2004 in the National Journal of Gynepathology done by Santos et al. It is to be noted that T53 wild mutation wild type vulval tumors have better prognosis than T53 mutation vulval squamous cell carcinomas. According to this study, the mean age of the patients for HCL-like lesions was 72 years and there were additional areas of DVIN and lichen sclerosis in more than one third of the cases, which was similar to a previous study done in a large series by Vantero et al. and published in 2006 American Journal of Surgical Pathology. Strengths and limitations. The strengths of this study was, firstly, the analysis was done in a large number of cases. Secondly, all the cases were subjected to both HPV DNA and P16 analysis, and hence complete exclusion of HPV association. Thirdly, independent analysis was done by two pathologists who were blinded to HPV and IHC interpretations. Limitations. Only the diagnosed cases of vulval squamous cell carcinomas was included. 
hence underestimation of the frequency of the precursor lesions. There was absence of mutational analysis. Thirdly, subjective nature of the histological evolution, hence the influence of the presence of invasive component and the precursor lesion in the same slide. Lastly, the absence of follow-up data for prognostic evaluation. To conclude, the authors found that one-fifth of the HPV precursor, uh, independent precursor cases was represented by HCL-like lesions, older age, overlapping features with other HPV negative precursors raise strong suspicion of HPV independent etiology. Routine use of HPV detection tests and IHC like P16 and P53 is recommended on all precursor vulvar lesions. P16 IHC is more reliable to classify as HPV independent than histology and P53 IHC. Females with HC like lesions needed more diligent follow-up because of higher chances and more rapid progression. Areas of improvement, we, need, we still need more large-scale studies of these unusual HCL-like lesions to correlate their clinical and follow-up data with genomics and next-generation sequencing to know more about the prognostic factors and molecular abnormalities. This slide shows a few of the references mentioned by the authors. And lastly, I show the splendid fireworks of recent National Day celebrations in Singapore. Thanks. Thank you. That was a really good discussion and a great way to end it with something happy. And I know it is the middle of the night where you are. So thank you so much for that picture. That was a good summary. Um, I, think, I think you walked through the paper well. And um, like we talked about before, I think this is a very complicated topic and it requires a lot of um, preamble sort of introduction just to get to the design of the study. And I think you did a good job doing that. It's um, like I said, it's a complicated topic that I think we're exploring more and more now, but it, it, I think you did a really nice job. So you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Thank you so much. And now, um, Dr. Rashid, if you would like to begin sharing for the second presentation. Yeah, hello, I'm Samia Rashid. I'm Breast and Gynecology Fellow at Hamad Medical Corporation, Qatar. And today I'm presenting this article titled, A Novel Group of a novel group of HPV-related adenocarcinomas of the lower anogenital tract in women and men resembling HPV-related endocervical adenocarcinomas. This is from Modern Pathology, December 2019, and we have some very prominent gynae pathologists in the authors, Dr. Voltagia, uh, Professor McCluggage, Dr. Eden, Dr. Martin, Dr. Longacre, and Dr. Ronet. So as we know, high-risk HPV infection is associated with squamous cell carcinoma, mostly in the cervix in women and oropharynx in men. And it's also associated with cervical adenocarcinoma subtypes, including endocervical, intestinal, endometrioid, and villoglandular carcinomas. The primary vaginal, vulvar, and anal squamous cell carcinomas have known to be associated with HPV infection. However, the association of adenocarcinomas at these sites with HPV infection has not been associated. So this paper describes the morphologic and immunohistochemical features of HPV associated lower anogenital those of HPV related endocervical adenocarcinomas. It's basically a case series of nine HPV related adenocarcinomas of the lower anogenital tract that presented at three institutes. So the immunohistochemical studies and in pseudo hybridization and PCR was done at the respective institutes. Four cases were from vagina, three from anorectum, and two from vulva. Two cases were of men, and these were at the anorectum, and the rest were all females. The immunohistochemical interpretation criteria used at all three institutes was the same. That is for P16, block type immunoreactivity of the nuclei and cytoplasm was considered positive and lesser staining was considered negative. For all the other immunohistochemical markers, if there was no staining, it was called negative. If less than 50% of the cells stained, it was called focal staining. And if it was more than 50%, it was called diffuse staining. For the in pseudo hybridization, DNA in pseudo hybridization was done for the older cases, and RNA in pseudo hybridization was done on the newer cases. So, HPV PCR was done in five cases. I'll go through some of the clinical features of these nine cases. So, 
As you can see, the age, it ranged from 38 to 69 years of age. The clinical presentation of the patients varied from asymptomatic and discovered at a screening colonoscopy to painless bleeding and mass. Only two patients were male, rest were all females. And if we look at the disease course, so two, case, two patients had recurrence, local recurrence, and four patients, uh, the, for four patients, the follow-up was available and they were alive and with no evidence of disease at the time of last follow-up. Coming to the most interesting part, the histology. So this is from the, one of the vaginal lesions and it's sort of, it has a nodular appearance and inside I have these villus or papillary like tumor growing. These are pictures from the anorectal lesion and I have a very prominent villus architecture here. Some of the other histological features that were observed include crib reforming, associated dysplasia, and intracytoplasmic mucin, apical mitosis, and apoptosis, almost goblet like appearance, and clear cell features. The vaginal lesions had either a lot of intracytoplasmic mucin, or in some cases, there was no mucin at all. And in two cases, there was associated adenosis, benign adenosis in the background. Coming to immunohistochemistry, P16 was performed in all cases and they all showed diffuse block positivity. CK7 was done on seven cases and it was strongly diffusely positive in all. In pseudo hybridization was performed in three cases. It was positive in two and negative in one. On that one case, PCR was done and it was positive for HPV 31. The other immunos that were performed were CK20, done on six cases. It was focally positive for two and negative for the rest. CDX2 was focally positive for five cases and diffusely positive for one case. Paxa done on four cases. On three, it was negative. On one, it was positive. ER was negative and PR was negative. Also, the one with clear cell features, Napsin was done on it and it was negative. Something interesting here is that in case number five and six, the HPV in pseudo hybridization and PCR both were negative. So one may think that, can we really include these cases just on the basis of P16 staining? So the reason, uh, reasoning used by the authors was that since the histological features were exactly the same as endocervical adenocarcinoma, so these, the P16 staining, it qualifies them to be included in this category. Some of the interesting studies uh, that were mentioned in the discussion, one was the longest series of primary vaginal glandular lesions. That was 14 cases. These were unassociated with adenosis. These describe intestinal type glandular lesion with predominantly diffuse case 20 and CDX2 positivity. P16 only done on two cases and it was negative. Another very interesting study was that of anal gland transitional zone type adenocarcinomas in which they found 11 out of 26 cases positive for high risk HPV. Now these are uh, HPV associated, however, they are not included for uh, driving any conclusion in this paper because there was not adequate histological description. Also, another paper, it found that high-risk HPV DNA was absent in 48 colorectal type anal adenocarcinoma. So the morphology was completely different in these cases. Another interesting thing was uh, this paper, seven out of 25 cases of colorectal and anal and neuroendocrine carcinomas were also found to be positive for high-risk HPV related RB and P53 mutations. So coming to the strengths of this study, this one was first of its, its kind. They tried to collect all the cases of HPV-associated uh, lower anogenital tract adenocarcinomas. The IHC interpretation criteria they used was same in all institutes. And they used a in pseudo hybridization and PCR instead of IHC. I think I'm the only, we are the only institute doing IHC. I have such a bad experience with it. Then areas of improvement first, 
it's already a very small study and the HPV association in case number five and six, we cannot be very sure about it. Second, other cases in, uh, present in literature that were HPV associated with similar histology and immunohistochemistry like the anal gland um, transitional zone adenocarcinoma one, they were not included. And rightly so, because there was not adequate histology, but it would have been nice if we could, we knew the follow-up of those patients, since the follow-up of these patients was so, so different from the other adenocarcinomas. Then it's the only thing, it's a very small series, so one has to be a little cautious uh, before driving conclusions from this. So the take home message for, from this was that the most salient morphological characteristics was the presence of papillary or williform villoglandular architecture in all of these cases. Then these tumors dis displayed features similar to those of usual type high risk HP related endocervical adenocarcinomas. Very important point that mentioned by the authors, vaginal cancers, we always have to rule out metastasis because that would be more common and we cannot solely rely on P16. HPV and pseudohybridization must be done. Or just, just something interesting that since all of these patients had good prognosis, so maybe if we have enough data, these patients could be offered different treatment modality. Overall, I found this paper very interesting and I'm definitely be looking for these papillary and villoglandular features and maybe even going for in pseudo hybridization testing when next time I receive such specimen. So yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a, that was a good summary. Um, thank you, Dr. Rashid. And just um, to remind everyone listening, we are uh, taking questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, which we'll address at the end of the um, meeting. I just wanted to give the participants time to um, go through their presentations and then we'll do questions at the end. But that was a, a good summary and a very interesting study, like you said. So now you can stop sharing and we will move on to Dr. Ribeiro. All right, um, let me turn on my camera. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> or evening or yeah, however it is for you. <laughs> Good day, I guess. Yes. So um, I'm from Brazil. My name is Hanan. Um, today, we're going to talk about differentiated exophytic vulvar intraepithelial lesions or DVIL. It's a relatively new entity and their relationship with Verruca's carcinoma of the vulva. This was recently published in Modern Pathology by, it's a collaborative effort between researchers in Toronto and Miami. Um, so basically in every organ where HPV is a thing, there is a dichotomy between HPV positive and HPV negative tumors. In the vulva, most of the tumors that are not HPV positive seem to be TP53 mutated, right? But it's sort of a false dichotomy because not all of the cases are HPV negative are TP53 mutated. And then the morphologic criteria, the look of those tumors is not completely well defined. So for example, we have uh, this newly described precursor lesion called differentiated exophytic vulvar intraepithelial lesion, DVIL, which is characterized by PIK3CA mutations. And it seems to be related or very similar to what was previously called vulvar acanthosis with altered differentiation. This lesion seems to have a relationship with Verruca's carcinoma, but it wasn't entirely elucidated up until this study. So this study aimed to look at the clinical morphologic and molecular data of cases of both DVIL and Verruca's carcinoma to try and find the link between these two entities. So first the authors did a query based on language. They looked for the words verruciform and Verruca's, and then they did a morphologic review to confirm the histologic appearance. Then they did P53 immunohistochemistry on all of the cases and a custom panel NGS 
targeting 11 relevant genes, including TP53, PIK3CA, HRAS, and others. First, let's look at the morphologic criteria that was used. The DVIL precursor lesion was characterized by verruciform acanthosis. You can see it very prominent here. Um, hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis, hypogranulosis, cytoplasmic pallor, pallor which gives it this uh, distinctive pink look, and bland nuclei. For verrucous carcinoma, the authors used the morphologic criteria described in the WHO book that was released in 2014. Um, they demanded the presence of discontinuous bobos, sort of uh, puzzle-like nests, penetrating the underlying stroma with a smooth pushing border. And also importantly, they needed to have bland nuclei, like you see on the high power image to the right. So let's look at the study cohort. At first, they found 44 surgical specimens that had verruciform or verrucus in the report. 36 of them had available paraffin blocks and 18 specimens had confirmed DVIL or verrucous carcinoma. These 18 specimens belonged to 10 patients. Five of these patients had both DVIL and verrucous carcinoma. Three patients had DVIL only and two patients had verrucous carcinoma only. 90% of these patients had vulvar pruritus as a symptom. Two of them had documented lichen sclerosis. Uh, two of them had lichen simplex chronicus. And there was no history of HPV-related lesions in any of these 10 patients. The follow-up ranged between 6 to 120 months with a median of 24. Seven patients were free of disease at the time the study was done. Uh, three patients had a recurrent verruciform lesion. And just I anticipated table number two. This is the mutational profile that the authors found. So 11 specimens had DVIL. Four DVIL lesions were mutated for HRAS, four for pic 3 ca and one of them had a BRAF mutation. For verrucous carcinoma, we can see that the profile is similar four cases with verrucous carcinoma had HRAS mutations, two of them had pic 3 ca mutations, and they also found BRAF and CTNNB1 mutations. So these were less important. This is the most important table in the paper, and it's the one that really drives home the point that the authors are trying to make. So here we see all the patients, and we can look at both what happened to them in terms of histology, the temporal relationship between lesions, and the associated genetic mutations. For example, patient A first presented with DVIL, and then 65 months later, she had verrucous carcinoma and concurrent DVIL in the same specimen. And all three of those lesions had the same or at least a very similar pic 3 ca mutation. And we can see that this pattern repeats itself in many of these patients. Like for example, um, in patient C, she was 61 years old. She had first DVIL, subsequently developed verrucous carcinoma and concurrent DVIL on the second specimen. And in the second specimen, uh, both verrucous carcinoma and the concurrent DVO showed the same HRAS mutation. So this is really interesting. And um, some of the images that illustrate the article also beautifully uh, serve as beautiful examples of the lesions. These are all patients who had that pattern that I just said. So they first presented with DVO, which you can see on the panels to the left. Then they presented with verrucous carcinoma which you find in the middle panels. And adjacent to the verrucous carcinoma in the second surgical specimen, they had uh, concurrent DVO. Other patients presented with both lesions, but seem to uh, have a sort of like a different evolution. So for example, the patient at the top panels presented first with DVO and then subsequent verrucous carcinoma but the second surgical specimen didn't have uh, 
adjacent Devo. The patient represented in the bottom panels first had Verruca's carcinoma, and then a couple months later developed subsequent Devo. So the article, although it has only a few cases, and this is due to the rarity of these lesions, it really defines a spectrum in which Devo and Verruca's carcinoma are situated. It shows that there is a temporal, morphologic, and molecular relationship between these two entities. All of the cases that were uh, described in this paper were tested for P53 expression, and they all had wild type IHC expression. In some of them, single nucleotide variants of TP53 were detected, but these were variants of unknown significance and they are considered non-pathogenic, which is supported by the wild type expression. Um, I would say that the potential clinical impact of this study is unknown. Um, we don't currently have unique therapeutic options regarding these lesions, but I think it's a great first step into really cracking the puzzle of what is the role of DVO, Verruca's carcinoma, and their associated mutations. I think the biggest strength of this paper lies in its simplicity. Like, uh, since these are very rare lesions, you don't really need a lot of cases to make a compelling argument. And I think this paper definitely provides a compelling argument. Um, they have a very well-documented temporal relationship between DVO and Verruca's carcinoma. And as areas for improvement, these are all things that can be done in upcoming studies. I would like to see a comparison between DVO associated with Verruca's carcinoma and the few cases of DVO that have been described previously that are associated with more conventional looking squamous cell carcinoma. Maybe we'll find different molecular features. I don't know, but this is something that is definitely an interesting uh, upcoming topic. And also a question that I had while reading this paper is if it would be appropriate to make an analogy between uh, Verruca's carcinoma of the vulva and the so-called inverted lesions that you can see in other anatomical sites, like in the bladder and in the sinonasal tract, you can have inverted growth lesions. And since Verruca's carcinoma is something that is aggressive locally, but doesn't seem to have metastatic potential, I wonder if it's some sort of inverted growth lesion that we just have a different name for in the gynecologic tract. Um, and as applications, I think this is definitely helpful to improve the recognition of such rare forms of disease. I personally don't feel very comfortable with either Verruca's carcinoma or DIVO yet, but I feel like the images and the descriptions in this study were definitely helpful. I think it's gonna assist in the communication with clinicians um, because we oftentimes need to help them understand what exactly it means to give a lesion a name, especially if it's a rare variant. And it also sets the basis for future research. So this is the building block upon uh, which new research targeting both DIVO, Verruca's carcinoma, and other forms of HPV negative uh, squamous lesions of the vulva, this is really a building block towards future research. And that's it. Okay, um, Hanan, if you wanna hang out, actually, if um, every all the panelists, all the presenters could share their video, um, and, and then I will move to the questions. And so you're free to keep typing questions if you like. Um, Dr. Rivero, there was a question about, um, and if you want to take a stab at this, why um, we why they have moved from the the terminology of vulvar acanthosis with ultra differentiation to the differentiated exophytic vulvar intraepithelial lesion? Because um, I think some people who feel they were just getting used to VAD now they're mm -hmm. sort of switching the terminology. Do you want to take a stab at that? I think it's because DIVO is considered to uh, better represent the neoplastic nature of the lesion. Yeah, that was my overall impression as well. Although um, it, it's Dr. 
is Gupta who's asking this question and he has been on journal clubs before. I know he um, uh, is, is a, a good, um, has a good ear for these kinds of things. I think his argument is that perhaps VAD was a better descriptor of what you were actually looking at. You know, mm -hmm. it's one of those rare pathologic terms that's not someone's name or something. Um, so I agree with you, Dr. Disgupta, that perhaps VAD was more descriptive, but I think what um, Dr. Ribeiro indicates is that this is more indicative of a precursor lesion. Other, otherwise, the, the VAD sounds more um, not non-neoplastic. I agree with that. As a, a question um, for you, Dr. Ghosh, about um, how you think the article you presented, um, you talked about practical applications. Um, what do you think this study added to our knowledge about HPV um, negative mimickers of, and you're muted right now if you're going to address this. If you're going to talk, make sure to unmute yourself. So, uh, actually, I think that in majority of the places, or it's not that everywhere, we do a routine P16 uh, for classifying the vaginal lesions into uh, HPV dependent and HPV independent cases. According mm -hmm. to the study, we find that there is morphological overlap between both both these uh, uh, precursors as well as the tumors. So it's very mm -hmm. important. The message which we get, the uh, key message from this article, that we should always be routinely doing a P16 and P53 along with the morphological study. And then when then clinically correlate with the age as well as presence of other in HPV independent precursor like lesions, which can help us to support that, yeah, this is a HPV independent case. And then definitely that will need more follow up, more um, because that has a more rapid rate of progression. Right, right. And I, uh, yeah, I agree. Doing P16, especially in older patients when you have these lesions, because like you mentioned, the the prognosis is very different for these patients versus the HPV-driven processes. So I think that's good. Um, and then uh, for you, Dr. Rashid, I was going to... Um, address, uh, you know, I like to pull different kinds of articles for Journal Club. I know the other two were more molecular heavy and yours was more of a case series, but like you mentioned, it, it's a very novel entity. Um, I, now that you said you're, you're looking for these, um, I wondered to myself, because as a person who used to sign on general surgical pathology, um, how often you encounter villoglandular tumors of the colorectal tract, you know, and now I just wonder at what point would you start doing P16 on all of this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I, so far I haven't seen any, or I don't yeah. know, maybe I wasn't even looking for those features. So I, I know. try to I be know. optimistic because yes. these, these lesions have such good prognosis, it looks like. Right, right. And the it's interesting too, because um, comparing these to, to say a colorectal adenocarcinoma, um, whereas they have HPV and those don't, it's it's like in other parts of the body where HPV-driven tumors, including in the vulva, tend to have a better prognosis. So it's, it almost seems like yes. clinicians would want to know this information, like you said, for possible differences in therapeutic intervention. Um, and it seems like we have a lot of um, questions about DVIL, <laughs> devil. I'm not sure, actually. I, I, I think it's DVIL. Um, Let's see, um, why is it called exophytic while it looks more endophytic on histology? Someone asked. What do you think, Dr. Ribeiro? Well, I think um, it might have been me moving a little bit too fast. Mm -hmm. The one that has more endophytic growth is the Verrucus carcinoma. I would right. say the DVIL is mostly exophytic. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. although there is prominent echinthosis, I mean, I guess that's yeah. an argument. And the lesions look verrucous uh, clinically, so right. that's a feature that's also taken into account when naming yeah. them. Yeah, certainly you could imagine that clinically those would be easily um, visible. And then someone else asked the question, uh, which you all can, any of you can answer or none of you, are individuals using both P16 and P53 in their workup of these cases routinely? In the very small number I have encountered, I have found myself using them for an exclusion process. So um, in your practice at your sites, would you like to comment on whether you're routinely doing P16 and P53 on these? Hanan, what do you think, Dr. Rivero? 
Well, we've been using it with yeah. varying degrees of success, I would say. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say it depends on the pathologist who's handling the case. I yeah. think sometimes some people prefer to rely more on morphology, although certainly these articles make an argument, um, including Dr. Ghosh's uh, paper, that um, sometimes relying on, on morphology plus immunohistochemistry, and immunohistochemistry can be helpful. I will comment that anecdotally, a lot of these specimens in the papers are beautifully oriented and lovely. You can see the top and you can see the bottom, but I think everybody knows that in routine practice, um, that's optimistic to think that all of your sections are going to look like that, especially from Dr. Ghosh's paper. These, are, these were sections adjacent to cancers, right? So you would assume that, that is a vulvectomy or a partial vulvectomy specimen where you're going to be able to cut, but when you get a punch biopsy, sometimes um, the people who embed it, it's, it's a little difficult to tell. Um, and we have um, an esteemed guest, Dr. McCluggage is here, and he has commented that a word of caution is that P16 can be positive and sometimes widespread in typical colorectal adenocarcinomas. Very good. Thank you for mentioning that. And another argument, as we have been commenting on um, using these in conjunction with HPV testing, and I think um, it was Dr. Rashid who commented on not loving her experience with um, uh, HPV immunohistochemistry, I would give that an upvote in my experience. It's um, not what I wish. Sometimes I have some frustration with HPV DNA in situ hybridization, but I have found that RNA in situ hybridization is lovely, but it's also probably something that's a little more difficult to perform in um, some clinical settings. It's expensive, it's kind of labor intensive, and you need special machinery to do that. So um, sometimes we just have to put all the pieces together. I think we have addressed um, most of the questions that have been upvoted. And um, I, I thank all of the presenters and I thank everyone for attending. And um, just so everyone knows, um, next month, the theme is uterine smooth muscle tumors, and we are going to have a guest moderator in um, Dr. Kyle Devins, who is a GYN pathology fellow. So if you are a fellow and you would like to moderate at some point or present, please get in touch with me and let me know. And I thank you all for coming today.